to Mark Reed from CB is going to talk a little bit more about some of the things he's learned about embedding research into, sorry, embedding impact into your research and also the need for more multidisciplinary and cross disciplinary. As we've heard this morning, the sorts of problems that Richard and others have outlined aren't solved by individual researchers in their own discipline doing things at their desk. They're actually <coughs> working in collaborative teams with other researchers and with research users. So, Mark, if you could take us through your thoughts, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, the research landscape, as we probably are all aware, is changing, and it's changing very rapidly. I'm going to tell you why I believe that we here in BCU and we as individuals can reap significant rewards from this new landscape. Uh, <coughs> Richard's been talking about economic austerity, uh, essentially uh, the case for research funding in a, a world of economic austerity rests on the idea that research promotes economic growth and competitiveness. <coughs> now, whether you agree with that statement or not, uh, research funders are racing to try and demonstrate the societal value of the research that they fund. Uh, and as a result of that, they're inc increasingly focusing their funding on directed calls for specific pieces of research. It is still possible to catch sight of blue sky in this research landscape, uh, but this is a sky which is increasingly being coloured by the dawn of the impact agenda. Calls for directed research are typically focusing on real-world challenges, and these real-world challenges are typically messy. Like the institutes that Keith will be talking about uh, in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment, the kind of global challenges that we face uh, today do not respect tidy disciplinary boundaries. How to make our society more sustainable in the face of rapidly growing urban populations and in the face of challenges like climate change. How to change attitudes lifestyles and the things that we eat in order to enhance our health and well-being. Or the pressure to continuously innovate to remain competitive in the creative economy. Collaborating across disciplinary boundaries, I would argue, isn't just something that is nice that many of us would like to do. This is an absolute necessity if we were to meet the challenges that society <coughs> has given to us. We need to learn how to do research as individuals and as an institution that is not just about monodisciplinary research, it has its place and is incredibly valuable. It's not just about multidisciplinary research or even interdisciplinary <coughs> research. I believe that we need to learn how to co-produce knowledge with the people who need it and who can benefit with it together, something which has widely been called transdisciplinarity. And this is where I believe that BCU is really on the front foot as one of Britain's leading uh, edge practice-based universities, whether it's the city uh, or the city region, whether this is our country or internationally, I think that what we do best is applied research that makes a genuine difference at the same time as moving forward the boundaries of knowledge in each of our disciplines. Unlike my experience previously working uh, in research-intensive universities, I've yet to encounter a colleague here at BCU who is only doing their research to advance theory or methods. There are many colleagues that I know and that I work with who are doing cutting-edge new theoretical work and developing new academic methods, but that is always for a clear purpose. We don't produce knowledge for knowledge's sake here, typically. We produce knowledge that seeks an impact. And it's that impact agenda that I believe 
is our real opportunity in the coming years. Impact represents 20% of the scores that will be released tomorrow. Many in government would like to see this approaching something closer to 50% by RAF, uh, for RAF 2020. Of course, the reality is going to lie somewhere between those two figures. If I put this into to context for a moment, just to give you a sense of the importance of this, uh, if you're not aware, uh, under REF, our outputs are judged on a star rating from one star to four star, with four star being internationally leading research outputs. <coughs> a four star impact case study is worth, wait for it, 20 four star papers. Some people have suggested that that may equate to perhaps between half a million and a million pounds per impact case study for those institutions submitting the best work. Now the fact that these impact case studies could well be worth significantly more in the next assessment period is being perceived by many research intensive universities as a significant threat. I would argue that in many post-1992 universities like our own, this is in fact an incredible opportunity. Universities such as ours that have perhaps a smaller research base from which to build, but which have a long history of community and societal engagement and have impact at the core of our mission. So I go around the UK and increasingly around Europe uh, training uh, researchers how to embed impact in the work that they do. Uh, I'll give you a flavour of some of the places we've trained just in the last year. Um, just last week, in fact, I was just north of the border uh, in uh, a research intensive university uh, and one of uh, the research leaders there um, in one of the, the schools uh, said at the end of the workshop as they were giving feedback, you know, I had no idea how important this impact agenda is, you know, how instrumental this is going to be for our institution. It just wasn't on my radar. No one's been talking about this, let alone giving us the skills, the confidence, what we actually need to do this. And this is a story that I hear repeated across the research intensives that I work with. This is not a story that I hear when I do this training here in BCU. Other sources <coughs> close to the REF panels have been looking at the research, uh, at the, 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 uh, the impact case studies, have uh, anecdotally commented on uh, the surprising weakness of many of the impact case studies that have been submitted by the research intensive uh, universities. Uh, something that could perhaps be interpreted as complacency. Thomas Kuhn, analysing the history of science, used the term paradigm shift to describe step changes in world view that occur after a new discovery or a new way of thinking. I believe that the impact agenda has over the last decade resulted in a radical shift in the way in which we define what research is and what research is for. And I believe that we are now in the midst of this paradigm shift. And the, the institutes that Keith are gonna, is going to be talking about next uh, are both evidence of and a response to this paradigm shift. But how do we make personal steps towards achieving impact, towards exploiting these opportunities in our <coughs> own research? Uh, I'm going to illustrate this with five principles and a, a brief story from my own experience, which I hope will illustrate them. This is, uh, these are principles that have come from my own research uh, that I've led, which combines qualitative insights with quantitative research. Uh, work from the UK, work internationally, interviews, um, exploring with researchers these questions, uh, with facilitators, <coughs> and with the actual stakeholders who work with researchers to try and understand actually what is it that actually enables us to generate new ideas in collaboration with the people who need these to make a difference. So the first of these principles is design. The first of these points is that uh, at the same time as designing the goals for our research, our research questions, we need to be thinking about 
What is it that actually we want to achieve? What are our impact goals? And how are we going to get to them? And as we design our project management, we need to be thinking about a knowledge exchange and communication strategy so that we can clearly and systematically achieve our goals and know if we're heading towards them or away from them so we can amend what we do to, to make that happen. Uh, increasingly, uh, research funders actually demand that we design this into our work. If we can demonstrate that we've designed it in, we're more likely to get the funding. And crucially, we don't all have to be experts at this ourselves. Uh, the research councils say they want around about 10% uh, of most uh, proposals to be costed in their pathway to impact. Other funders say similar things. If you go talk to the research councils, they're incredibly frustrated about the fact that researchers just don't get this. They put out directed to calls for proposals, and they will sometimes in those calls stipulate, we want 10%. The average they get on these directed calls where they stipulate 10% is 4% of the budget for uh, the pathway to impact. And they're now talking about ways in which they can uh, enforce this uh, more broadly. That means you can pay for experts to come and do amazing knowledge exchange and impact with you, and you don't have to have the hassle and the stress of doing that all yourself. So take advantage of that. The next point is to think systematically about who actually is it that we want to engage with our research. And I think very often we have some vague ideas about this, but when we actually sit down and start to think about exactly you know, what are the key messages from my work, who are the key audiences that might tangibly be, tangibly be able to benefit from this, you begin to realize that actually there are very different groups who have very different interests in quite different parts of what we're doing that we need to emphasize, differently to those different groups, and we need to understand what motivates those groups to engage with us, uh, and actually what are the modes of communication that are going to enable us to really get these people on board, form relationships with them, and then uh, co-develop ideas and achieve impact with them. For me, core to this, the most important of these principles, is engagement. And if you can boil this all down to one word, I believe that these principles are simply about empathy being able to put yourself into the shoes of those that we think might be able to benefit from our work. This is about investing time, effort, energy in long-term relationships, which are based on trust, which are two-way, in which we respect all the different sources of knowledge that can come to bear on these incredibly challenging uh, problems, uh, and respect those different sources equally with our own academic knowledge. In training I do, I talk about stakeholder analysis. I encourage you to come along to one of the regular sessions I run for BCU staff, and I can teach you some of the tools that you can use in your own research to do this. Uh, impact, for me, is something, yes, that you can look at over decades, uh, which many of the case studies we've submitted to, to REF this time around have done. But the reality is the people we are working with are often working on much smaller timescales. Businesses working quarter to quarter, governments working year to year. People who we work with typically want results sooner than the typical three to five year project that we work on as researchers. And there are many things that we can do to provide those tangible impacts much sooner than we might think. Uh, the most simple one is that most of us will write a literature review at the beginning of uh, a project. A literature review may never see the light of day. It may end up condensed into part of a paper three, four years later that sits behind uh, a paywall. Um, we forget that we're privileged. Many of our stakeholders really benefit actually being able to be immediately on that cutting edge and just making those available as working papers, turning them into briefing notes, can be incredibly valuable. And finally, reflect and sustain. We need to be reflective practitioners, reflecting not only on our research, but on our knowledge exchange and actually how this is working and how we can improve on that. And this is often about finding creative ways of sustaining a legacy of knowledge exchange beyond our funded research projects so that we can retain those long-term relationships that can then come into play in our next uh, knowledge uh, our next research application. So these are my five uh, <coughs> principles. Um, you can uh, have a look on my website. There's a, a, a nice five-minute video that summarizes these in an entertaining way if you want to find out more um, and lots more papers you can read about this. But I'll conclude 
I think, with a, a story to try and uh, illustrate some of these, uh, some of these points. Uh, and see if you can draw these out for yourself. Perhaps you'll bring different points out from these stories. Uh, I did my PhD in the Kalahari Desert, um, and uh, I wanted to have a family. Uh, I didn't want to be spending the rest of my life travelling back and forth to Africa. So as a PhD student, I uh, identified a funding opportunity, uh, a £50,000 sea corn opportunity, relatively easy, uh, to do some work in the UK that I thought might be able to take some of the generalizable, transferable lessons uh, from my PhD to put it into a UK context. That contact was UK uplands or peatlands or hills, um, and, uh, and this was the team that I brought together. Now, you might say naively, uh, as a PhD student, I started out on the premise that I'd like to work with my friends. So I brought together a team of my friends to do this research. It was exploratory in nature, so that was fine. But actually, uh, this is a, a model which I've increasingly used. <laughs> Um, and it's not necessarily friends, but ultimately interdisciplinary teams work when they are based on trust. And I see a very worrying trend across the HEI sector where universities are increasingly creating institutes and uh, initiatives that pe place people together on the basis of their expertise on paper, which are very effective and get in the funding, but then you discover that you actually have teams that cannot work together and do not then deliver uh, the, the, out the outcomes. So for me, the second point about uh, interdisciplinarity uh, is about having a real focus on values and understanding what is it that motivates the people we are working with. How is it that these different people that we work with understand what knowledge is, what constitutes <coughs> valid knowledge, and how is knowledge created? Because when we discover huge differences in this, it can make it very hard to work effectively together. Um, and I think finally, the point that many of us often forget is that you need to actually invest time and energy in building capacity for interdisciplinarity. The belief that if you put a bunch of people around a table with different disciplines, if you want to tackle the same problem and it will work, is incorrect. You need to actually build that capacity. And in this project, we designed an internal training program to help each other to understand the different tools, approaches, backgrounds, and language that we use in this meeting. Models were used by the social scientists in a conceptual way with the, and the natural scientists as numerical computation models. And we had no idea we were talking at cross purposes. The research that we did uh, started out uh, working in the Peak District National Park, as you can see here. Uh, we were covered um, uh, by a uh, Guardian newspaper article. Uh, a local NGO contacted us and said, Hmm, this sounds interesting. We want to restore peatlands. You're talking about how carbon might pay for that. Uh, could we work with you? We said, well, yeah, but this is probably five or ten years off. Uh, but that gave us a doorway into a, a local community. Um, the advice they gave us was get the landowners on board because these guys are going to be deeply sceptical of you. They've got lots of bad <coughs> experiences. It's going to be really hard work. So we invested lots of time really getting the trust of the landowning community. And it backfired incredibly on us because we then went to try and talk to the conservation organisations, the uh, conservation agencies from government, and they innately distrusted us because you're working with the landowners, so you must be you know, against us, therefore. And it took us two years of painstaking relationship building to get these other, you know, the conservationists, who I thought were our natural allies, on the side. That was fine, but what we wanted to do was to have a national impact, and taking it from that local scale to a national was a real effort. Uh, we weren't sure what the national policymakers were interested in. I did lots of cold calling, emails, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, eventually got in the door with one policymaker. He said, well, there's this one consultation, you know, maybe you could contribute to that. That one tidbit then enabled me to then get in with other policymakers who gave us more information about what we could do as an impact on a national scale. Um, and a few years later, a couple of years back now, uh, when I joined here, my entire salary was actually funded on DEFRA consultancy projects. And those consultancy projects, uh, in addition to the fundamental research that I was doing, actually enabled us to get directly into the policy mechanisms uh, of, of government, government and led to the launch of the UK Peatland Code uh, last year by the Environment Minister, <coughs> which is the UK's first uh, peatland carbon market that enables the private sector to invest in people in restoration. Um, I think I'm out of time, am I? 
Yeah, so I will conclude uh, by just... One more minute, thank you. So how did we get there? I'll give you just a flavour of some of the things, so just to inspire you to think out of the box. So we started by really understanding who was it that was in this landscape so that we could understand how to work with them. And then using the kind of things that they were using, yes, newsletters, newspaper articles, but YouTube videos, project websites, and the articles in the magazines that these people are actually reading in their day-to-day -day lives. We produce policy briefs. But the important thing was that these were being used as a visual aid as part of you know, direct relationships with people that now trusted us, and consultancy reports, etc. We did various work with the creative arts, created a music video, a storybook. This is a, uh, a piece of art, this, this bag. You can ask me about it uh, later if you want. But it is art, honestly. Um, and uh, we developed a bunch of smartphone apps uh, for, for walkers to communicate our, our research findings. And have invested quite heavily in social media as, as well um, to uh, yeah, uh, interactive websites, uh, schools resources, to try and communicate our findings to a much wider public audience as well. Uh, and just recently we now uh, have just launched a, a social media campaign uh, to try and get gardeners to go <coughs> free, supported by celebrities like Vivian Westwood and various uh, major NGOs. Uh, and making some progress with that as well. Just this, this broader public movement to turn what is very often a, a kind of a, a scary or boring or desolate habitat into something that people value as incredibly uh, important. I'm going to skip over this, uh, this bit of research because I've run out of time. I'm very sorry about this. Um, the, the key point of this is we did some research actually looking at how this particular bit of research got into policy uh, and practice uh, or not as the case may be, and the key point was that we found that these uh, uh, intermediaries, the, the conservation charities, were hugely important in getting research into policy and practice. And that's a really controversial point for us as researchers, how do we work with those knowledge intermediaries to make an impact without them uh, taking what we do and uh, misusing it? We can perhaps discuss that later. Um, so that's, that's me. I'm finished at this point, but the uh, point is, Hugely exciting opportunities for us as individuals and as an institution. <coughs> we know best practice, we know what we need to do. Now let's all go and do this. <coughs> Thank you.